All right, so a little about the Middletown Township Historical Society before we get going. So we were founded in 1968. We are a nonprofit, 501c3, and our goal is to preserve and promote the history of Middletown. So we do speaker events like this once a month. And uh, if you go to our website, middletownnjhistory.org, you'll find a lot of other resources we have. One of them are our original and exclusive videos. We have a video about our town hall exhibit. We have interviews with longtime residents and we have recordings of the speaker series. Again, that's at middletownnjhistory.org. On our website, we also have digitized Middletown Township High School yearbooks going back into uh, 1922, I believe. And those are free and completely searchable. And we also have some reflectors, which are the student publications. Also on our web website, we have a map that shows how the land in Middletown was developed. So you can click on various highlighted areas and see when a school got developed, when a park or a housing development was developed, and you can see some uh, historical photos in there as well. Again, off of our website, we have our archive on there, our archive of physical items. So right now we have about 225 listed and this keeps growing and it's completely searchable for you to look at. Over at Town Hall, we have an exhibit. If you walk into the main lobby, you'll see it right underneath the stairs. It's open during business hours and it is a collection of Middletown postcards that have been enlarged and they have a caption below them to explain what is actually uh, being shown in the photograph. And also in that same area, we have this large painting that depicts King's Highway and various scenes and landmarks around it. So if you have some time, go over there, look at it. And in the Middletown Library, where some of us are tonight, we have hanging a painting, which was donated to us a couple of months ago. It shows the Monmouth Militia uh, taking a a privateer British ship that had uh, come off its moorings in Sandy Hook Bay. And we believe this occurred somewhere around the Port Monmouth area. And this was uh, uh, donated to us by Monmouth Timeline, and it was painted by Steve Schreiber. And right now we have it on loan to the Middletown Library. If you're in the uh, room and you haven't seen it yet, I recommend you take a look at it. And if you're uh, interested in purchasing a print of that, you can do so at steveschreiberfineart.com and use code MTHS. You will get a discount and we will get some of the proceeds. So if you'd like to support the Historical Society, you can become a member, you can uh, become a community sponsor. If you represent a business, you can volunteer your time, donate an item to us, and you can get more info at middletownnjhistory.org or come see me after the meeting. Once again, thank you to all of our sponsors, our members, and all the supporters that you see on the screen. And you can connect with us at our website, middletownnjhistory.org, or at any of the social media that you see here. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Randall Gabriellen, who is going to introduce our speaker tonight. Railroads at the Jersey Shore and the history of railroading has a rare distinction. The subject is very important and very popular, and we're pleased to welcome a large crowd uh, tonight. And we're also pleased uh, to have Bill Elwell tell us about the uh, subject. Uh, Bill, an adjunct professor at Monmouth University, is thoroughly invested in the uh, subject. He is a scholar, a modeler, and a fan. There was a history of vacationing at the shore before there were railroads, but it wasn't exactly friendly to New Jerseyites. And Bill's gonna tell us how it uh, developed. And there's an important aspect of Middletown in this um, history. So we'll have a lot to learn and be well entertained. Bill, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Randall. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'd like to say before I start that um, it is Giving Tuesday, and please consider giving to this great organization, A, for having me, but B, because without 
donations to societies they really couldn't exist. So please do. Uh, a little bit about me before I start is I started my railroad history journey with my parents. That's God, 27 years ago. That's a long time. Um, 27 years ago, I've been a rail fan ever since. I've been a railroad modeler ever since. Uh, went to Monmouth University for history and have been there ever since. Now I'm teaching. Um, I started a lot of my history career with the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seagirt. Check them out too. Great museum. Um, and that's where we're at. Oh, on Saturdays, I work at the Model Railroad Shop up in Piscataway, which is a treasure trove and museum unto itself, the oldest in the United States. So if you're into railroads, check that place out as well. So I like to caution, um, the title of this presentation is called For a Wonderful Vacation, Go by Train, which is the publication, of, it's a, the title of a brochure that the Pennsylvania Railroad put out in 1954 as part of a series of go by train to all these different destinations. But it, I think it really captures the essence of what I'm all about with this. And that is the history of tourism at the Jersey Shore developed through the railroads. And we'll explore a lot of that through this hour-ish presentation. Um, I do like to also caution that while I am a big rail fan, this is not a railroad history. This is a history of the Jersey Shore, a history of railroads and where they intersect. Oh, other way, sorry. So I always start off with this postcard, which is uh, a picture postcard taken in about 1905 in Bayhead, which as from Point Pleasant, this is right down the street for me, but indicative of the kind of scenery that we're seeing at the Jersey Shore at the turn of the century as railroads were bringing all the tourists here. Um, the Bluffs Hotel in the back, this is Twilight Lake. The railroad was torn up in the 40s. We'll get to that. But you know, this is probably one of the closest areas where railroads came directly to a beachfront. And it's purely to serve hotels and the growing tourist industry. Just a map. This is a, 19, a Pennsylvania Railroad 1927 system map, which also depicts other railroads in the area, but a lot more track back then than we have right now. And you could reach almost every single mile of beachfront of the entire Jersey Shore from Sandy Hook to Cape May Point by a train. The exception being Island Beach State Park, another part of this discussion. Um, I zoom in on Ocean County, but don't need to just to show that there's a lot. Each one of these railroads has a story on how they got here and 95% of them, the answer is to reach the beach. Um, the only one that doesn't is the Raritan River Railroad and, uh, and the Freehold and Jamesburg Agricultural, which Raritan River is like kind of tangential to this entire thing. So we're not really gonna get into them. Um, I feel like we can't continue this discussion without talking about how they got here. So I promise I will blow through this as fast as I possibly can. The first railroad to reach the Jersey Shore is also the first, one of the first passenger railroads in the United States. And that's the Camden and Amboy Railroad, which reaches South Amboy in 1833. The thing about this is that it's chartered at the same time during a canal building craze in the United States where it's chartered with the Delaware and Raritan Canal, which canals are a proven technology in carrying stuff, especially in England. And there's a canal building craze. So the state legislature issues public, it wasn't public, it was mostly owned by them, public stock um, in both the Camden and Amboy and the Delaware and Raritan Canal. They expect the Delaware and Raritan Canal to blow out. It takes about 10 years for all 100,000 shares of the Del the Delaware and Raritan Canal to sell out. The Camden and Amboy sold out in 20 hours completely. The benefit of a railroad still as an untried technology is that it can be used year round. Now it's extremely dangerous, but within about 10 years, traffic on the railroad from Bordentown to South Amboy completely overcomes that of the canal. To do this though is Every, there, there's less of a concept of a private company at the time. So knowing that they could make so much money on this, it's a really great example of corruption in history, is that almost all of the stock in both companies was issued and purchased by legislators, judges, 
you name it. I mean, it's the state government. And in the charter, they issue something called the monopoly clause. This monopoly clause basically states that no railroad can be built serving New York between the Philadelphia New York corridor at all. It has to be the Camden and Amboy. And no other railroad can be built within three miles of either side. They know that more railroads are going to come, but by right off the bat, issuing it like this, they have just completely guaranteed their wallets for the rest of their lives. Problem is that 20 years later, more investors get involved and they want to serve a different port. They feel that they can get around this mon monopoly clause by serving New York and Norfolk, Virginia which is away from Philadelphia. And at that time, it's one of the largest ports in the United States. So the Raritan and Delaware Bay Railroad is chartered starting right here at Port Monmouth and goes all the way down to a point on the Delaware Bay ending up being bridged in with a ferry across and then down to the Delmarva. Problem is that this airline, as it was dubbed in the press, was completely nothing. It was almost blowing smoke. The, it only got as far construction-wise as Lakehurst, Lakewood, one of the lakes. Um, and it couldn't really get off the ground. Eventually, too, pro, um, during, they got a, secured a really big Army or War Department contract during the Civil War to carry any and all war material through New Jersey. But the Camden and Amboy, citing that monopoly clause, the R&DB could still carry it, but all of the profits went to the Camden and Amboy. So that bankrupted them. They were purchased by the New Jersey Southern Railroad, headed by Jay Gould, the big railroad financier. And he built it all the way. He built it all the way to the uh, um, to the Raritan Bay shore. But the Panic of 1873 hit like right after he got into this. And he ran out of money. He was investing a lot in Western railroads. And even though he lived in Long Branch at the time, he just wasn't going to put this much or much money into it. The key in importance to this presentation is that they are the first railroad to reach a Jersey Shore location. They reached uh, Long Branch in about 1870, 1871 on a spur, specifically to serve the hotels. That then, once the Central Railroad of New Jersey buys it in 1879, lasts as the Southern Division of that railroad until the 1970s. Um, they build some branch lines to serve some other budding resorts along the Raritan Bay Shore. We're very familiar with the Seashore Branch here, which is now the Henry Hudson Trail, as well as another new bike trail, the Barnegat Branch Bike Trail from Tom's River-ish down to Barnegat. The other one I mentioned before is the Freehold and James Jamesburg Agricultural, which is the only Jersey Shore Railroad that has nothing to do with the shore. It eventually got some, but it's between Freehold and Manasquan, where it links up with another railroad come up, coming up in a minute. Um, it's built to just transport farm supplies. Um, eventually takes the King and Queen of England in 1939. I mean, that's probably its biggest claim to fame. Um, the most famous is the New York and Long Branch. And this survives today as New Jersey Transit's North Jersey coastline. And it's arguably also the most important. Um, it serves on a line coming from the Raritan Bay shore all the way to Bayhead, every single seashore resort and is almost directly responsible for every single town along the line. It's a very unique railroad. It's possibly the most unique railroad in US corporate history. And I pulled this and obviously we're not, I, I'll read it. Um, railroad magazine, it was this pulp magazine that came out in the 30s, 40s, 50s, all through, through the 70s. And they did everything from advertisements for lingerie to railroad like ghost stories and every issue that have one history article. And this is one from July of 52, where they state that the New York and Long Branch is in effect a highway department for the Central and Pennsylvania Railroad. Side note, it was jointly owned by two of the largest railroads in the United States. It provides the track, crossing protection, stations and agents, dispatching and some servicing and switching for the 44 passenger and four freight trains of the CNJ and for 39 and four freight trains of the PRR, which move over its rails in whole or in part on a normal weekday in midsummer. 
There are hundreds of examples of joint use of track in this country, but few or none in which the owning company runs no trains, yet issues tickets and timetables in its own name and maintains its own dispatcher, agents, and track forces. The key to this very, very important paragraph is that these two railroads thought that the Jersey Shore tourist trade was so important that they were going to buy into a company that barely existed. They, it didn't have its own trains. They each ran their own trains along the line. The tickets were interchangeable with each other for a little added fee if you're taking the Penzi route. It really depended on what your final destination was going to be. Anyway, some other ones just to get out of the way is the Tuckerton Railroad, which is kind of the uh, forgotten stepchild of the Jersey Shore Railroads. Uh, it serves the Barnegat Bay region and all the gunners and those that were doing sports down there. It was ripped up in 1941, and the only profitable year it ever had was in the mid-30s when it was carrying the supplies to build Route 9, which actually killed it. Philadelphia and Long Branch is a little closer to my heart. It became part of, it's part of the Pennsylvania Railroad and it's one that serves Seaside, serves Seaside Park, Seaside Heights, Lavalette, cut across from Trenton, went across the Bay, came up and met the New York and Long Branch in uh, Bayhead, Bayhead Junction. You'll still see that station name. Uh, it's claim to fame is the trestle across the Bay burned through some teenaged arson in 1946. It wasn't making any money, so they ripped it up in 48. Um, now we get to the South Jersey Shore, which is way down there. The Cape May, the, your Atlantic cities. Um, the first railroad is built in 1876. They keep going through the 1880s. Um, all of these fold eventually into the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines, which is all that orange and red down there, which is another weird combination of railroads that exists, again, specifically just to do the tourist trade the Jersey Shore. So there we have it. 10 minutes at all the railroads that exist at the Jersey Shore at the time, at least the ones that matter and weren't like one mile long. But anyway, tourism is the key here. And what did it look like in New Jersey before the Civil War specifically? Tourism wasn't really a concept before the Civil War. People traveled. If you had a lot of money, you would either go to, you would go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land, uh, your doctor, if you could afford your own private doctor, would suggest that you go somewhere for your health, be it Niagara Falls, the Catskills. Um, the salty sea air is a really important thing, especially for tuberculosis. Um, so Long Branch develops as one of those tourist hotspots for those in antebellum. This is one of my favorite paintings, but it's the bluffs at Long Branch, which is now Pier Village and destroyed. Um but you're coming here for health reasons or you're coming to escape whatever massive money-making project you have in your upper high-class career that you might have. The other major resort besides Long Branch is Cape May. There's only two towns above 500 people at the Jersey Shore at this time, and those are both of them. Long Branch is catering to your New Yorkers, but Cape May is very oddly catering to wealthy Virginia plantation owners. The reason for it is because it's right along the packet steamship line to Philadelphia, where a lot of them are going to sell the cotton and tobacco and whatever else. So they figure they can get aboard a ship, it'll drop them off at Cape May, and then their stuff will continue on to Philadelphia. They can get a nice relaxing month while it's all sold. A lot of this dis or starts to change to m closer to what we know of it today by uh, this guy, Dr. Jonathan Pitney, who is a traveling doctor on Absecon Island down what is now Atlantic City. And there's seven houses in one tavern for them all to go get drunk in. And they he is their doctor. He shows up on the island maybe once a month. And when he goes there, he realizes that it's three miles off the mainland. There's no mosquitoes. The, the winds here are a lot nicer than three miles away. And there's no development. This might be a good thing for me to get in on the ground floor on. So he forms the Camden and Atlantic Land Company and the Camden and Atlantic Railroad, two halves of the same whole, with a number of other people that he 
found that were along the route. And the idea was, I'm going to buy all the land. I'm going to buy all the land for a right of way to Philadelphia, and I'm going to lease it and make the world's first resort. They started advertising it as the El Dorado of the East. By the 1880s, within 30 years, we get the Monopoly map that we know today. It became the largest resort in the world by the 1920s, and it was all planned. All of the land was owned by the railroad company. The railroad and the land company would lease com uh, land to hotels or they'd build their own, and eventually just it, it grew into such a big city. Um, there's other examples before we get back to Atlantic City of railroad or railroad interest owned hotels. This one's the um, Baldwin Hotel on Long Beach Island, which is owned by the Baldwin family of locomotive manufacturing fame. Um, then there's another one, the Barnegat Park, which is now Pinewald, south of Tom's River, um, where this was, and I forget his name offhand, but it was a former lieutenant in the U.S. Army that after the Indian Wars, he decided he wanted to make a hotel. So he chartered his own railroad, bought a lot of land and made a place for uh, veterans with PTSD. Um, here's some pictures of that. Gets us to my favorite part of this conversation is how many of you are or were bennies how well, first of all who does not know the term okay well, how many of you are or were bennies wow a lot of locals tonight that's reassuring um Benny is a term that gets thrown out around a lot and sometimes i've gotten into some arguments with colleagues and there's a lot of dumb things in the press about it but what about shuby has anybody heard of shuby before okay why might Benny be an acronym? Yeah, what? Right. Don't steal my thunder. So the idea here is, and I'll start with Benny because Shuby's more relevant to the Atlantic City part, but Benny stands for Bayonne Elizabeth Newark, New York. It's a catch-all acronym, meaning anybody above coming to the Jer northern Jersey Shore for the weekend, for the day, for a month, whatever tourist idea happens here. Benny stands very specifically from the largest transfer stations along the New York, the feeder railroads to the New York and Long Branch, Bayonne served by the Pansy and the, New York, the Jersey Central, Elizabeth, served by the Pansy and the Jersey Central, Newark, served by both, uh, and New York, Pansy, or by ferry, the Jersey Central. I got into an a, a academic discussion with a professor of mine who are, claims that he was a, a folklorist for New Jersey, who, who in an Asbury Park Press interview, he comes out and says, there is no way emphatically that the railroad went to any of these places. So this argument is wrong. It's, it's there. You might not be able to get to all those places anymore, but the feeder railroads to the New York and Long Branch certainly went through all those places. And the reason it's an acronym is because no matter where you were coming from any of these, you know, if you were coming from Tarrytown, New York, you had to go through one of these stations in order to get here and they'd stamp your luggage with a B, an E, an N, or an NY. So those are the most common stamps you're seeing, hence Benny. So... And there's a lot of luggage coming to your beach vacation. Shuby, oh, let me go back a little bit. Shuby is a little harder, but it's more directly related to the railroads. Those All those hotels that the Camden and Atlantic Railroad built, they were very specifically, for, um, it was a, a very important industrial revolution concept of making sure that we can get everybody spending money wherever we can. So they own the hotels, they own the restaurants, they owned the railroad. They wanted you to come spend a week in that very long, early, pre-Victorian antebellum idea of you're coming on a vacation for a month. But now you have people that have a little bit of spending money from the working in factories. They're trying to escape for a day before their shift comes back over at the end of the weekend. But things flow downhill and tourism is one of those concepts that if the rich people are doing it, maybe us in the new middle class, we can do it as well. We have to budget ourselves, but this is how we end up getting. So they would go for a day. 
and they'd pack their lunches in shoe boxes, therefore skirting the railroad owned restaurant. The railroad let it known to the press that, oh, these people are shoebies, very derogatorily. And then it just stuck. You know, it, it became a term for day trippers. These are the first day trippers in basically world history that are able to leave their homes, leave their jobs for a day, a weekend, and go do a vacation that's just relaxing. Mostly because the trains were an hour from the beach. Anyway, to plug this profit gap that the railroads are, are coming out with, they're, they're realizing they're not getting the money that they would have with their hotels and restaurants. They start figuring out that we can charge different kinds of fares. So they come up with this idea called the excursion fare, which is basically, you know, if you buy it, you have to buy a ticket from a specific station and you can use it only between two stations. You can't get off at another one. And it has to be between a certain couple of days, like, you know, from July 1st to July 30th, you have to use this. Unlike, you know, I'm still sitting on maybe 20 NJT tickets to Asbury Park because they don't go bad. Um, but it worked. And, you know, you get a better price on this ticket. But it was a really important way for people to say, like, wow, they're catering to us. They also start advertising this basically nationwide. The Pennsylvania Railroad, by the turn of the century, is the, the country's largest employer. I think it, the number was about 12 times larger in terms of employees than the federal government, which was the number two employer, even at that time. Um, they're from New York all the way to Chicago and beyond, so their advertising reaches very far. This is a brochure from 1916 for very specifically Chicago, and out of 46 pictures in this entire booklet, 30 are at the Jersey Shore, and this entire page is explaining round trip tickets and summer tourist tickets to Jersey Shore destinations. They continue this, and they they really push the idea of special fares to the beach, um, special seashore party. It's all different names for the excursion fare. Um, it continues on and off even until the 1980s, the 1970s. This is uh, 1974, the CNJ, which is at this point beyond bankrupt, tried it again, didn't work. NJT buries it in the fine print because they don't want you to see that you can get a discount. So this one is from the 90s, I guess. Um, but anyway, this is so attractive that resorts like Asbury Park take off. This is a postcard from 1911. And that's Railroad Square, if any of you... Um, no, or go out to Asbury Park like myself. That's Johnny Max now. Um, but it's packed. Like all these people are getting off the train. And this causes the railroads to also have to start investing in infrastructure, which they did at the Jersey Shore in different way and with more attention before 1940 than pretty much anywhere else in the country. Um a lot of it has to do with stations. They upgrade the Asbury Park station, especially a number of times. This is the initial AP Ocean Grove station that is replaced in the early 20s um, by this gorgeous structure, which was the basis for a Lionel product in the 50s. Um, it gets so in Asbury Park gets so big that they end up building five stations within 1.8 miles. So you've got Asbury Park, Ocean Grove, you've got Asbury, or you've got North Asbury Park, which is this one. You've got Interlake and Allenhurst and Elberon, five miles. Believe it or not, they can still do that pretty fast. Anyway, it's not just stations. Um, they try a lot of different technological things aimed at speeding passenger trains. Uh, these are called track pans, which allows a steam locomotive to refill water on the go. They put them in Long Branch and maybe one or two other places, but now you don't need to stop your locomotive to take on 20,000 gallons of water. You can just, with the scoop, get it on the fly and get everybody to the beach. The New York and Long Branch is also the first place in the entire country to experiment with automatic block signaling which is just this really cool way of telling train ordering trains with whatever they need to do so you know they publish it in all these different journals it's a really big thing it speeds up trains a lot to where you can get 85 trains a day in the summer do it with equipment too um the new york and the with the 
creation, the construction of Penn Station, the city of New York would only let steel cars to mitigate fire risk into the tunnels, but most of them spent their entire summer at the Jersey Shore. So, you know, you've got development of these cars as well. You get it in locomotives where depending on the decade before World War II, the most important and powerful locomotives are serving the Jersey Shore. Um, this is one of those special ones that I was taking Tom before, but um, the most powerful steam locomotives and by the end of World War II, all of that stops. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Another important part about the Jersey Shore advertising as we move back to publications is guidebooks. They kind of developed the idea of what a tourist guidebook is that in, in the 1870s. And you see them for all over the country. You see some for Niagara Falls. You see some for taking the transcontinental and seeing the Indians out west for the first time, anything like that. But the thing about the Jersey Shore is there are so many tourists coming here that whereas you might get one guidebook every five years for one generic location both railroads are publishing a guidebook annually with all the differences in hotels this is the first one that i have 1877 for the entire pennsylvania system um really cool blurbs in here with fares in them as well um by the turn of the century you get really gorgeous really great artists making maps that just kind of entice you to want to come here um they publish the, these guidebooks in brochure. This is that one from before with the excursion rates um, in brochure form and guidebook form uh, with, again, some of the best, most enticing. This is everything the Jersey Shore has to offer to Joe Schmo in Chicago that has never heard of this place before. So I love this one, too, because, like, you know, we've got aviation that's going to kill the railroads at some point. Um, but Jersey Shore scenes. Um, this one here is another great one, also Atlantic City. Every year in the 20s, one of these came out. Uh, this one is a cool example that I happen to find on eBay, but it's advertising as a station copy for a different railroad in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So they are advertising this with other companies as far as they could possibly go. Um, this is a great one. Looking from the Raritan Bay Shore, well, look, you can ride horses here too. Um, by the 30s, they finally move away from the artists and sex sells. So let's put, you know, two women in bathing suits on the, you know, who else is going to spend their money in the 30s? By World War II, it changes. They've gotten rid, and with practical reason, there's no tourism happening. Everything is for the war effort, and the guidebooks change into pamphlets saying, you know, you can still go to the beach, but remember that all of our cars are now serving the war effort. During World War II, Atlantic City was known as Camp Boardwalk, and it was one of the largest Army Air Force training facilities in the United States. And this is telling you, you know, you're you're probably not going to have your scheduled train. By the 50s, they're just little brochures with maybe a page in them. But the key to all the Penzi advertisements is they're they're very generic. They might mention some towns or something, but they don't get into the nitty gritty like the Central Railroad of New Jersey's publications. Penzi is massive, like I mentioned. The CNJ, its moniker was the Big Little Railroad because it carried a lot of people and a lot of tonnage, but it was really only in Pennsylvania or the eastern corner of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, in the 1880s, they hired this German immigrant named Gustav Kobe, who was known as a metallurgist and a cartographer, to travel the CNJ system and tell us what you see. So he came out with this guidebook, which is incredibly detailed with like what kind of weed you're going to find on the on the ground next to this hotel in Lakehurst. Um, and then they republish it. Um, they come out with another one. Then the CNJ takes a page out of his book and makes their own uh, guidebooks. And these ones are fascinating, again, every year, because they list every hotel in them. They have what the rates for the American versus the European plan are going to be into them. They give you daily fare changes to all these places. And the idea is, you know, the Penzi doesn't need to advertise with specifics because they're going to get somebody from somewhere in the, in the system. But the CNJ is like, come here. We have all the information. Again, though, sex sells. They try it in the 20s. It works. 
The Reading Railroad is half of the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore lines. If, if we're talking about 1933 on, they do their own little guidebooks, but they kind of focus them more on specific towns instead of listing them. But they're in this, too. Great one as well, especially for here. But they advertise the Sandy Hook route, which was the former Raritan and Delaware Bay. Um, taking the steamship across and avoiding the all rail route through what is now known as the chemical coast through Elizabeth um, coming down to get a beautiful ship ride and then, and then continue on your way. This is during the great depression as well. So they're really, you know, this was a big step for them to publish something this artistic. Um, and then they're also one of the first companies to try historical tourism in the entire world. Like, calling somebody a history buff and using that as a way to get like a little bit of a fare out of somebody. Um, but they're really pushing this one day outings, even through uh, up to world war two. Um, I'll skip that one for a second. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of non-Jersey Shore, it was so important to the railroads that a lot of non-Jersey Shore advertising talks about coming here, like as a side trip to the 1940 World's Fair. Um, they had an entire couple of blurbs, but you know it's an inexpensive side trip to skip the fair for a couple of days and go to Atlantic City. It'll only take you like two hours to get there. Other Western railroads did the same with large connections to the Penzi of the CNJ, like this one from the 50s for the Union Pacific, which is out west, like Omaha, Nebraska. They are really trying to tell you like, hey, you know, you can go out west or come from out west to it as well. Timetables are all a really big study of railroad history and what exactly they're doing. And there's different kinds of timetables. There's like system timetables, which have everything. And there's local timetables, which are for you traveling from Asbury Park to Middletown or something like that. Um, the Penzi, obviously, with their much larger system, is able to advertise in their timetables as well. And almost every single system timetable between 1910 and 1940 has a centerfold or at least a, a, a half fold of some Jersey Shore advertisement. So we've got that one, a lot of boardwalk scenes in this, and the language in them, I'm not going to read it now, but the language in them is like, it makes me want to go and I live here. Um, even just, you know, little ones, just come here if you can. It lists all the towns that are major along the line. But local timetables get it as well. This is one of the earliest in my collection. Um, the local timetables are usually really plain, really austere. They're printed on what we would equate to computer paper nowadays because you're printing a couple thousand of them and they're probably going to get tossed by the time you get on the train as well. So they might just have a logo on them, but not at the Jersey Shore. And the idea is that pretty much everyone that's coming here is local anyway. So we're going to spend the big bucks on a lot of these local timetables. So 1884 or 1882, the candidate, I mean, you've got like in their beach clothes, which is a dress and a suit. We're going to the beach. Um, New York and Long Branch does it as well with this lithograph with the bluffs and the Matawan trestle, but it, it's stunning. I mean, this must have cost them like five dollars to make. Um, 1890 comes around. And for me, this one always reminds me of like an eighties horror movie, the font like way out of time, but, uh, the long branch boardwalk, it, it's beautiful. And, and, you know, this is what you can see on your local train. Publish a lot in newspapers, um, all the specific trains, which is very interesting because, and you can't read it. But in 1906, the Penzi, because they're as large as they are, they decide they're going to start pulling their advertising uh, in newspapers for timetables. And the Asbury Park Press rails against this, where they say basically the published timetable is just as essential to the proper service of a railroad company as the train equipment. In many instances, it is the only medium of information and should be provided for by law which they liked their pretty timetables, I guess. So Penzi pulls out that entire budget and they end up putting all of that money into making their local timetables look even nicer. So these are for Atlantic City from Philadelphia with great nautical scenes. By the middle of that decade, they're starting to put photographs, the first place in the entire country that we see photographs on this kind of advertising, always with a boardwalk. Um, again, then with maps as well. 
Um, the only other place that I've seen anything even come close to this is way out west in California. This is the only time that any other timetable mentions like coast trains, which is very unique. Steamships, we get that kind of advertising with, with the with the steamships on the Sandy Hook route. Um, great graphics on those as well. Um, the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines in South Jersey, they really capitalize on all the different beach scenes as well. Uh, both before and after World War II. But during World War II, all of this stops. And all of the Penzi timetables system-wide, whether it's PRSL or Penzi, get two soldiers and a sailor. We're doing our part for the war effort. There's no advertising budget anymore. Everything goes towards making sure that they come first. The... With all that advertising budget pulled, you never really see a seashore advertisement in a timetable for at least, for either the Penzi or the CNJ again. Um, this is the only one that I've found at all. And this is from 1959 with an advertisement for people from Richmond to come to Atlantic City, don't drive. Kind of like begging. Only one. Um, the exception to the rule is the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines, because besides serving Beasley's Point Power Station, rest in peace, the only real reason for their existing was taking people to the boardwalk. So seasonally, they would put, you know, like go on the boardwalk tram or fly a kite in the winter because there's nothing else to do uh, or be on the beach. But in the 50s and 60s, they're like grasping at straws. When Amtrak was heading to Atlantic City after the legalization of gambling, they tried it once on a system timetable, and that was it. You never see any sort of advertisement for the Jersey Shore again in a timetable. In addition to timetables, they also start to run special trains to the Jersey Shore. It starts out with charters like um, this company, which I can't find anything on, but they've published like 10 different of these little trade cards, which are really funny caricatures. Um, this charter special trains for groups of their employees to come. It continues on through Point Pleasant for pleasure seekers, the American law. A lot of people host conventions in Asbury Park in Atlantic City and charter these special trains with special things like Pullman cars, which have all of the different accoutrements that, and luxuries that one could think of. It's not just coach service. Some of this is through, meaning it's coming from points west or points north or south, and they have sleeping accommodations. But other times, it's really just lounges and bar car and everything like that. Uh, they're also advertising to different groups of people, like this newspaper advertisement, which is talking to the women folk to come to the Jersey Shore. The most famous of these is the Blue Comet, which I'm not going to get into very much because it's its own lecture. But the CNJ comes out with the Blue Comet in 1929 as a premier deluxe all coach train between Jersey City and Atlantic City. And the only pro it was at coach prices and you would get all the luxuries and refinements that you could possibly think of. The only problem was that it was instituted in September of 1929. So it had a month and a half to go. <laughs> It lasted until 1941. Uh, the advertising was phenomenal. They painted everything blue, um, gold. Everything's named after a comet. It's great. Great idea, wrong time. It got so popular that Asbury Park and Middletown and a few resorts in Monmouth County were asking the Jersey Central to institute their own service, just like the Blue Comet to here, but it never panned out, probably because of the Depression itself. Um, the Penzi matched them with their train called the Nelly Bly, which again, all coach, but it wasn't as famous. It was kind of faster than the Blue Comet, but it's named after a reporter who traveled the world in a very speedy amount of time. Which moves us on to the final part of this presentation is the shift towards what we know it to get today, the death of tourism by railroad. And as the Jersey Shore got more populated and people started moving out of the gross cities, they're starting to realize that you can take the train to work. You know, I don't need to live within the the unregulated pollution that exists before any before World War II, but we can go there. So, borrowing from the uh, the excursion fare, they come up with these ideas called the commuter fare, which I'm sure many of us have used in this room before. But again, you buy it for a month. It's valid on any train, buy another one, you get a discounted fare. 
Um, but they still are capitalizing it as seashore resorts before World War II. They're not calling it the North Jersey coast or anything like that. They're really pushing that, you know, you can commute from the resorts. Again, with this one before, uh, uh, at the end, during World War II, but right at the end. <clears throat> to the things we love to hate. The highway system really start, got off the ground in the 30s and, and the federal highway system specifically, like I mentioned with Route 9 killing the, uh, the Tuckerton Railroad. But every single one of these highways, whether state, federal, authority, was built pretty much mirroring the railroads. In some cases, they took over the right of way, such as on the Tuckerton Railroad. In other cases, they're within a mile or two. In the case of Matawan, they had to build it under actually Woodbridge as well. Um, the thing about these railroads is after World War II, now you have everybody going out and buying a car on the GI Bill. There's much more cars out there. People don't want to take the train anymore, much because a lot, during World War II, a lot of money wasn't put into the equipment. Um, now we have airliners that can take us to more exotic destinations like Florida. Um, plus, if you want to get there, if you want to get to these places, you can do it on your own terms because of these state highways. Um, you start to see this in the early 30s, where the Pennsylvania starts to warn and say that, you know, they're going to start approving and, and making timetables more accept, uh, accessible to commuters. Um, a new company comes in called Transportation Displays Incorporated, which removes the financial burden on the railroads to publish their own timetables. And what they do is they'll publish the timetables by selling advertising space in the timetable. All of these advertisements have something to do with commuters. So like this one is all these different things to do in New York, like showgirls on Broadway and stuff like that. Um, it was really popular after World War II and they're town specific, unlike a lot of the other timetables. Uh, you got Banks and Manasquan, Buick dealership, which one's that, Mc, uh, McKelvin. This one has a special place in my heart because this is the timetable that brought my family to the Jersey Shore. Um, my grandfather picked it up when he was researching where to live. But, you know, Tally's Dodge is right down the street for me until like 10 years ago. But that's the idea is we're no longer going to advertise the seashore resorts because we're not doing the advertising anymore. We're selling ad space to be relevant to the commuters. Continues all the way. Um, Hello, Dolly's a really cool one on this one. But again, it's all stuff that's just relevant to people who are hopping on the train. They have two hours to snooze before work, and maybe this is relevant to them. The railroads themselves still publish timetables, but in much smaller numbers, and they're really austere. All the advertising is now taken care of by this company, and you know all Penzi timetables look like this. This is the furthest an advertisement gets is the 64 World's Fair, and the C&J ones are just the Herald. They get even sadder on the New York and Long Branch ones, which is just block lettering. And then continuing with the idea of infrastructure and equipment too, to match how after before World War II, everything was put as attention towards the Jersey Shore railroads and tourism. After World War II, they didn't give a about what was coming to the Jersey Shore. It becomes the dumping ground for timetables and equipment. Originally, they test things like the first diesels bought by the system instead of steam locomotives. Um, they start to shove the now out of date steam locomotives like uh, let me go ahead here. Oh, I guess I deleted that one. Um, the now out of date steam locomotives run their last miles on the Jersey Shore, the last steam passenger service in the United States in uh, by a class one railroad is the New York at Long Branch Railroad um, in 1957. But even brand new diesels that are built in the mid 1950s that are just not liked anywhere else along the entire 10,000 mile system run out their last days at, at the Northern Jersey shore pulling commuters because nowhere else are they wanted like these that are built in the uh, mid 1950s. And then they're already shoved to the Jersey shore because they just don't work anywhere else. CNJ does similar where they build diesels for commuter service instead of something else. Um, just they buy some too. By the mid uh, 1960s to the mid 1970s, everything is decrepit. I mean, you can see the 
you know, the rust and the the peeling of paint on everything. And maybe some of you commuted in the 70s and remember things looking this bad. Um, again, with the end uh, by the mid 70s as well, you have all the cars are too old. So they have to go elsewhere to start buying cars just to keep the commuters running. So they go to Western railroads and buy rolling stock for, uh, for name trains like the Empire Builder out between Chicago and Seattle, just because they exist and they're cheap. They're getting rid of passenger service with Amtrak. So we'll just buy cars and you get this multicolor color thing called the Jersey Builder for a few years. Anyway, a lot of this commuter thing rationalizes when the state starts getting involved in subsidizing the CNJ and subsidizing commuter service as a government service. They start to, if we, if you think back to that map with the Bennies, they try and put two of the railroads together so there's not two things serving one. So this is called the Aldine Plan, which gets rid of a lot of the CNJ service and routes it through Penn Station. Um, timetables again, though, they start like the only time they get colorful is the bicentennial where you get the red, white and blue. But then it goes right back down into New Jersey Transit, where they're just really government publications with nothing special about them. Um, they have the information and that's it. At least with NJT, they kind of theme them with the sailboat, like Atlantic City line has the uh, a lighthouse on it and some others. But there's no advertisement whatsoever. It's just. It's there. So that brings us almost to the end of this. Uh, you know, the Jersey Shore Railroads, it's mostly for tourism until World War II when there's a massive shift in tourism, in technology available to people. And then they just gave up. But because they had already created such a passenger-based economy, there's no freight here. You know, you might get coal to South Amboy for those piers that were once there. You might get some local stuff. But there's railroads exist. They profit off of carrying stuff, not people. But because it became such an important part of who we are here, whether you're a tourist, whether you're a commuter, the state had to step in like they never did really anywhere else in the country and say, we're going to save you. So the map will probably never look like this again. But that's not the end of the story where... A lot of people, especially in this area, are re-advocating for a new passenger service to New York. In the 90s, there was this thing called the MOM Project, standing for Mammoth Ocean Middlesex, which is a way to tap the growing market of Freehold, Toms River, Interior, Mammoth County, um, and get them also using existing track to New York. It never got off the ground. Somebody got paid off in Trenton. I'm talking to the guys that are still alive from the MOM Project. But it's a very plausible scenario. Um, there is hope on the horizon where the Chesapeake and Delaware Railroad, which is this conglomerate of a bunch of short lines, especially in Northwest Jersey, purchased the former Raritan Delaware Bay between Red Bank and Tom's River. And they just a month ago reconnected because New Jersey Transit wants to get tra freight trains off of here and instead route them through freehold and down this way. The thing is that New Jersey Department of Transportation still owns the track. And if I'm reading things correctly, C&D did a beautiful job of rehabbing it. And then as soon as it's all done, NJT might step in and say, hey, it's our track. We're going to run passenger trains now because, you know, that's how things are forced. But anyway, they're out there. If you want to go see, like, literally the only place in the United States where new railroad is being constructed, it's right here in Monmouth and Ocean County. So go check it out. That's all I got. Thank you all so much for coming. And I'll take any I know we also have the Zoom, so I will probably take some of that as well. But please. Yes, that is that it was ripped up in the mid 70s passenger service st stopped in 67 and it was curtailed back and back and back. But that was part of the Raritan and Delaware Bay Empire. 
and then later on the New Jersey Southern Empire, especially under Jay Gould, who, oh, let me see if I can, oh, wait, we have a map around here. Okay. So it's, it's kind of hard to see, but the idea here was Part of it was the freehold branch of the Central Railroad of New Jersey, the freehold in New York. All of that gets pulled in around 1870. And the idea is serve the Raritan Bay shore, serve the steamships that are up here and on Sandy Hook, depending on what decade you're talking about, and then come around through Long Branch, which is still one of the biggest resorts in the country, and meet up with the New York and Long Branch again. It's pretty much like a beltway. In, in the interstate sense. But as development goes on and as less people are taking this train, they cut back to smaller trains. So first, you know, you get maybe two cars. Then the Central Railroad of New Jersey bought these things called RDCs, rail diesel cars, which are self-propelled units. And, you know, you don't have to use all the infrastructure in a train. Well, you'll get one or two of those coming through. And then they're just I think in the unique New York and Long Branch, there's tickets that are like ridership is recorded as like three riders a day. And that just doesn't financially make sense. So now that's the Henry Hudson Trail. And I remember seeing what they call a camelback steam engine, which would take the traffic from Matawan to uh, islands. And then you'd have the other train track going to the Monmouth Park. But uh, I remember it slowly went to the, when you said the single car, which was, it looked like a streamlined car called the Bud Car. That, like yes. Self-propelled self car. And uh, I remember when you just simply had one car for maybe a couple of years, and then that was it. It like folded up. But uh, uh, Matawan was a, was a really good connection station. Uh, at that point. Uh, Matawan was an impressive <laughs> junction. Yeah. It really was. I, I can't go back far enough, but you've got, if we're going to talk about camelbacks for a second, the re, it's a camel, you, when you see a steam locomotive, you see the cab where the engineer and fireman are in the back of the locomotive. And it's because the boiler is in front of them. Um, there's a firebox where you light the fire and they're using lower grade coal usually, but the CNJ along with its partner railroads like the Reading and the Lehigh Valley are all centered in the anthracite coal region of Northern Pennsylvania. So they had access to anthracite, which burns at a much hotter and cleaner temperature. So these locomotives have a Wooten firebox as opposed to a different kind, which is way back and wider and bigger taking up the space that a cab normally would take. So the cab now sits in the middle of the locomotive and it looks like a camel's hump. I I guess the picture got deleted from this presentation. I, it's fine, I probably screwed that up, but any other questions? Depends on which part of it. What? Oh yeah, okay. So when did the Sandy Hook route get uh, lip, ripped up? Depends on the part of it. Um, the Sandy Hook Railroad continued uh, up through World War One-ish, maybe a, a few years uh, before that, because then the, the War Department steps in, they have Fort Hancock, they don't want passenger trains in an active army installation. So even up through World War II, the Coast Artillery is still running not only trains, but railroad artillery through the, the thing. But it was the mid '50s when that is ripped up between Sandy Hook and Long Branch. No problem. Is there any Zoom questions? I don't want to leave them out. Did the tracks come up to the joint phase and lane was part of the old system, or was it built separately from the North American? That is part of the old system. That was the Southern. When in the '40s during World War II, when the uh, the county donated the land, or well, donated they sold at a very low price the land to uh the navy to build earl they it was chosen because it's out of the way and it has the railroad already going through it so all of the system of that trackage was built by the navy but the main line is the southern which still exists uh same with uh like uh you know naval air engineering station lakehurst now the railroad that used to be in there also came off the southern but that's long gone itself Okay. Ah, okay. That's a great one. Uh, which reason? <laughs> There's a lot of reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with money. A lot of it has to do with they already purchased the diesel equipment. 
Um, the electrification stopped at South Amboy until the 70s, the 80s. Uh, off, off of a few, it was New Jersey Transit that pushed that through. And they only went as far as long. I, one of the main reasons that isn't really talked about, but I would say is main is because they had the space in Long Branch to have a little bit of a yard, but they're just like, there wasn't money. Nobody was putting, nobody wanted to put money into NJT to begin with. You know, at that point, they're still dealing with the decrepit old equipment that is lasting. I'll go forward a little bit further. Where'd it go? Oh, I'm going back the other direction. I'm sorry. Um, they're still dealing with with diesels and passenger cars that are 30 years old and so under maintained that, like, you know, nobody wants to commute by train and they're only doing it because they have to. It, um, and the only new equipment is this right here, which was purchased on on loan from the state by the Central Railroad of New Jersey in 1968. These GP40s are still run on New Jersey Transit and run better than anything of the new stuff that they buy and blows up as soon as it gets off the, the ship from Germany. So they didn't electrify because they, they didn't have the money or the desire and they already had the equipment. You know, why why waste it? Probably weren't very many passengers south of um, Long Branch. I think the lowest, and that's still the reason why it's not electrified. I mean, they just built a substation at Bayhead at the Bayhead Loop, but that's more for other power things. And you know, I get on at Bayhead all the time. Where people get on with me. And with respect to those uh, cars from the west, don't knock them because they're over the road cars, which were built differently. Than they are. <laughs> Uh, so they were a lot more beautiful but they're not suited for commuters anybody know why one door they have one door on each side on each end so if you're getting off in the throngs of penn station you're waiting like 30 minutes to get out of that car so it just it like great idea great price but not suited to here Little story. One of the first, I think it's the GG one, the diesels. I'm going back about 30 years. Broke down in Middletown with the one of the last, and that particular train that broke down, they have it in the museum. I think it's either now Tunum or somewhere in Pennsylvania. That exact train, that exact uh, locomotive. I was hoping that somebody would bring up that story. That wasn't a GG one. That was one of Conrail's GP40s. Yeah, one of these, right. but not that one. Yeah. So that locomotive. I don't think that's in the PA collection, but that local, that is one of my favorite stories of railroad history in New Jersey, because for the first time people are saying enough of this, the no money that's put, basically what happened is due to equipment fail. I forget the exact reason, but the train bypassed Middletown station. And meanwhile, that was probably the most popular station for commuters at the time. Just went all the way to Little Silver. So when they realize they get and the crews are sympathetic to them, they get out, they camp in front of the train. The police come and start carrying everybody back to Middletown. And that was enough reason for the New York and Long, well, the former New York and Long Branch for NJDOT to come out and say, we're doing something wrong here. This has now made press in California. I was on that train. You, were you? We had a, you know, where the old station was, the old, which is still there, it's now used right. by the police. Well, the train just, just went past the overpass, uh, the uh, guardrails, and that was it. It was smoking and everything. Everybody was saying, what do we do now? How embarrassing. But, you know, everybody was happy. It was, it was a whole group because when you stopped at South Amway on the new trains, where, the way, where you had to switch over from electric to diesel. Right. Everybody would go to the little store and have a beer. The bar. Story behind that is, I forget the name of the bar, if crazy. you can. There's a bar backed up to the South Amboy station. And when engine changes used to happen in South Amboy, all the commuter, it would take about seven to 15 minutes, depending on the train. And the bar knew the regulars that were commuters. So they would have everybody's between one can and six pack on the counter with a tab that they'd call in to pay. So you just like you have seven minutes, go get your beer. You're gonna last the rest of your train haul. That uh, 1975. Any other questions? I'm not around. I was a question. I've never seen that Francis Augusta uh, uh, silver painting of the Bluff and Long Bridge. Uh, where is that painting? 
The Met. The Met. It's either the Met or the New York Collection. New York Historical? Yeah. Oh. You know, uh, oh, it'll take me like 18 minutes to scroll through this <laughs> again, but... Um, one, I, I don't think it's on display right now. Well, uh, well when we when we're done, I'll I'll take a look at who it's with. Probably wasn't. Just want to share with everybody that college day five weeks ago last, and we're in the Young Museum in San Francisco, the great art museum, and we're thrilled to see at least one, maybe a couple of pictures of Long Branch. And it was by Winslow Omer. And I thought, like, oh, what a famous. I think at that point, you know, I was 21, I didn't realize how national, how big Long Branch was. The biggest. I mean, I, I have some tax maps and property maps of like the 1850s through the 1870s through Long Branch. The names you see on the property for them, Jay Gould, like, I mean, obviously we know Seven Presidents Park and Church, but, you know, you're seeing the presidents on there. One of the best railroad stories and uh, American stories is when President uh, Garfield was shot and they sped him down. And would you like to take any of this one or? Oh, that was McKinley, I thought you said. Yeah, it was Okay. Um, they sped him down from New York and they had the CNJ build a one mile track in six hours from the New York and Long Branch, Maine and Elberon to his front porch because they couldn't risk taking him out of a car. He died a month later. Yep. Ordinary people helped, and there's still one property made out of the tie, or one building made out of the ties. Oh, yes. Um, for any that are interested, we I have my entire collection that this is built from on these tables over here. Uh, feel free to rustle through. Just don't rustle too hard. And uh, if you can, leave them in the sleeves, because fingers are bad for paper. But um, I... Everything I make from doing this goes right back into the presentation. I don't make really anything doing this, but I, I try. I'm, my goal is to have the largest railroad, Jersey Shore Railroad paper collection to one day make a museum out of. So it is it will all be publicly available. Do you see anything happening in the future for the railroad? Scroll, scroll, scroll. Um. Can't scroll. Can you go like two slides ahead? Um, yes, I do. I think these guys are going to save railroading at the Jersey Shore. They're probably not going to do passenger, but they'll probably enter into some sort of agreement with the DOT to run because they own the track, NJDOT. But they did such a phenomenal job on the rebuild so far, and they're not even close to done. But I mean, Freehold and Tom's River are two of the largest growing and fastest growing communities in the entire state. And they, you know, it, it takes me an hour and 15 minutes to drive from Point Pleasant to Tom's River, which is 14 miles. Like, it's it's ridiculous. There's got to be some better way of doing this. Please. Uh, somebody read that. I line to Tom over. Want to connect the railroad to Long Branch to the NYC through Middletown? That's true. I've never come across something like that. Um, not sure myself. Through Middletown. I mean, there. my answer to that question is there were about 40 railroads proposed through this area. And I, I have a map somewhere, probably over in there, that just lists all the different like proposed routes to Tuckerton of all places. Um, there were at least 17 railroads proposed from Philadelphia, Camden to Tuckerton that never came out to be. So it wouldn't surprise me in the in a, the least, but it does depend on when when that happened, because anything rooting to New York, if it was still before 1872 with the Camden and Amboy, would not have really flown. What's the worst disaster in the history of railroad? Um, not well, there's the broker wreck in 1951 in Woodbridge, which a book was written recently, which is pretty good, but I don't necessarily agree with his conclusion. Um, that it was during a, 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 a an employee strike on the CNJ. So, all and this is again shorebound trains, but all those people that would have been split into CNJ trains and Penzi trains coming home commuting from New York had to return 
on one or two Penzi trains. So the broker, which is a named businessman's train, has like 600 people aboard with a capacity for two, three, 400 maybe. And this is while they're building the New Jersey Turnpike. So to build the permanent bridge over the now dug turnpike, they put this, this temporary trestle up, which is basically on six by sixes shoved into buckets of concrete. And it's rated for some locomotives, but it also has a speed restriction. And the speed restriction is 10 miles an hour or something. And ostensibly the engineer missed and it killed 83 people tumbling onto the embankment. Um, the the author of this book blames the engineer wholeheartedly. I would shove partial blame on him, a lot of blame also to the New Jersey Highway Commission because they built that monstrosity of a trestle. I lived there, Amway Avenue, uh, when this and my father was on a first aid spot. And um, I remember going, to the, the engine went through a, a Hudson 4464, a uh, big, big engine, it was on its side, totally on its side. And one of my friends lived on Fulton Street, which was the street that, where the, where the uh, train flipped over. And all they brought all the people into the living room and the living room rug was just all yeah. It, it was a disaster. It was true. It was Pacific so they, they locomotive. The pilings, when you looked at the pilings, I was maybe seven or eight years old, maybe nine, I don't remember. But uh, the pilings were actually broken in. It, uh, yeah. It was, it was really bad. Poor engineering on the highway department. On disasters, perhaps Carol and the audience would like to hear about the train that uh, dropped into Newark Bay. That's another good one. My my uncle was a fireman responding to that with the Newark Fire Department. Um, they missed the bridge. It's 1961, um, 58 in that area. He wasn't there that long at that point, but um, they missed the bridge, went tumbling into the bay. That was 20 dead, 48. Um, another disaster, but it's it's kind of the broker. This it, it's to me. It's an indication of just how little attention and care they were giving the railroads post-war. And, you know, we'll do everything for the interstate highway system and the turnpike. And but, you know, we're not even going to properly maintain the signals or the, the bridge gearing or anything like that. And there's still hundreds of people aboard the train. So. There's an entire historical study on how lawsuits specifically for and against railroads completely shaped American legal theory. So, Tom? In both of those tracks, um, final result blamed on the engineer. In the case of the bay draw, he just failed to stop the train. The red signal was there. The split derail was in place. The train bounced along time. Yeah. But um, he had waved to the towerman. He knew that he had progressively slow signals to the stop. And at some point, accelerated the train for reasons nobody knows. The reason they blamed him was because they said he had a heart attack, but he had fluid in his lungs. So he must have been breathing when he went over. But it was a fireman. So even if it was an intentional suicide, the fireman not have agreed to do that that day, but didn't stop the train either. In the case of the broker, it wasn't that the trestle couldn't move the train. It was that the engineer was looking for a temporary yellow signal. Right. And it wasn't in place on that section. And he was doing track speed over the shoe fly. Which right. Meant, but he could have made it across at 15, but he was flying. And the water in the tender went boom, boom, and took the train out. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that was also a very foggy day. It was a rainy day. Mm -hmm. The last three cars didn't that where we had a lot of business men didn't get didn't get hurt. They still stayed on the track. Well, Money has his privileges. Yeah. Yes. It's very interesting story and probably many people know about it. When the train went off the grid in Newark in 1958, the one car was hanging down below from the grid into the water. And on it was a number of the train, uh, the car, which was 532. Well, 
you don't know if they say the coach gambling was in the plane of the city, but had a probably as big a gambling operation in Jersey City. And it was the famous numbers game. Maybe anyway, people would look at the paper on the front page of the news and a lot of papers. There was the number 532. And they played that and big bookies had to borrow. And they borrowed from banks too. Half a million dollars. You know, just amazing. That number came out. And we see actually it was a total mutual hand of absolutely a crazy scratch. Now, I think we're running out of time in the room. So, are there any Zoom questions left? Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, I understand the NGC retains rights to the right of way along the Hudson Trail. Is there any thoughts that could be redeveloped for white right rail? I don't see why not. Um, there are plenty of examples of mixed use bike trail slash railroad a right of way is, and, and I've been corrected on this a, a number of times, but a right of way is usually about 50 feet wide. So there's plenty of room for train plus bike. They do it in Pennsylvania. There's no issue that is people. Well, no, the, the Hudson Trail along the bike right down twice by the store. So if I were there's there's a number of factors, but hypothetically, I would say that it could happen. Some of those nimbies and chewing because that is a chewing became nimbies. Okay. Um, if anybody else has further questions for me, I have my email on this last slide and I have my cards with me if you'd like to email me. Thank you again for coming. Be nice to the society and